Good morning. Today we're going to look at Matthew chapter 12, and we'll look at blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and the sin that cannot be forgiven. Uh, we'll look at that extensively today, but to lead into it, we have to remember what we've been studying about uh, Jesus has been healing on the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's been showing his authority to teach. And then today we're going to pick up with the miracle that leads into the uh, so-called sin against the Holy Spirit or blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So let's just go right into it. Let's look at this. Then the demon oppressed man who is blind and mute was brought to him and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw and all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? Just a little bit of a note here. Uh, the son of David title, that is recognition that is he the Messiah? Because remember the, the golden or the scarlet thread that runs through the scripture goes through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then all the way down to David. King David is going to be the one through whom the the chosen king. So anytime they say son of David, that's that's Messiah taught. Then the other thing that's interesting in this just little section is uh, blind and mute. And usually nowadays we think of other conditions causing blindness, um, you know, a retina issue or something like that. But here it's pretty clear that this blindness is caused by a demon. Um, and I remember, and how would you know that? Well, I suppose if there's no retina issue and nothing else, and, um, this person is controlled by Satan or one of his demons, then they would be, be brought. I wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but obviously uh, Jesus is able to, but that, that's a, that's a hard question. Okay, so then verse 24, but they, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. So you remember, we've gone through this already. I won't spend a lot of time, but Be Beel or Baal um, and Zebub flies. So and this is derived from that Philistine god formerly worshipped in Ekron, uh, later adopted by Abrahamic religions as a major demon. Now, I don't think the ones that worshipped it considered a fly, but in the the language it, it's translated over, it it gets that meaning. But they would obviously make fun of them by by referring it to that way. So. Okay. Knowing their ever, their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house to divide against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if the spirit, but if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Uh, so notice here is where we get the, the whole talk of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying the spirit of God that I cast out demons. So where does this power come from? Holy Spirit. Um, which is interesting because we always say, well, doesn't Jesus have the authority to cast out them on his own? Yeah, he does. But he's given up that um, power be when he became man and dwelled among us. Or as I think it's Philippians and Colossians talked about, he emptied himself of that authority. So the Holy Spirit's the one that's going to give him this, just as we have authority from the Holy Spirit as well uh, to do different things. Uh, let's just back up on this. 
So he's he's kind of making this argument. If I cast out demons by Beelzebul, the Lord of Flies, by whom do your sons cast them out? That, that's that's kind of a pretty uh, strong attack against them because they do cast out demons themselves, even in the old Old Testament. You don't hear about it in the Old Testament Bible, at least to my knowledge. It's not mentioned much, um, casting out demons. Uh, one that we'll talk about in a bit is King Saul. Remember, he had the he was controlled by a demon, and he would uh, also that was tormenting him. But you never hear of an exorcism to remove that demon. Well, apparently later on in the uh, intertestamental period, and even maybe a little bit before, there was some casting out demons going on. So they could cast out demons by Beelzebub. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think so at all. See, they would be casting them out by calling on God's name. They would say in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which would be the, the right way. In fact, I got a call or one of our former Bible study members that's dealing with the they have a relative or a friend that is uh, has a. They were messing around with demon worship and Satan worship, and now they've got a demon in their house. Well, yeah, obviously you're going to have that. So I said, "Well, let me come over. I'll I'll do a, a exorcism of the house, and the demon will leave." But before I would do that, you would have to do. I'd have to instructor no more messing with that stuff because it'll be right back and even worse uh, so but i i always call on jesus name to cast out any demon like that i've never done it on a person uh, but seems like the most i see it is it them being in people's houses uh, where they're messing with uh ouija boards um doing spells stuff like that yeah you'll end up with a demon in your house you do that because you're you're what, what is you, you think about a ouija board what is it you're calling on satan or one of his demons to come and predict the future and i, I know most people think of it as a game but it isn't and or the other time, you sometimes see it as when somebody else lived in the house and then somebody new moves in. And that's why it's good to bless your house before you move in, if you move in from somebody else. Because they, I, I don't know, I've, there's this house down on, I think it's, is it Pierce Street or Douglas? We used to walk the kids to school and you could just sense an aura of evil coming off of one of the houses. They had a huge statue of Buddha sitting on the porch, too. I never liked walking by them. I, if I ever bought that house, we'd cast. I'm sure there's a demon in that house. Uh, it's because they're calling on a false god. You're going to... Uh, Buddha's not there, but probably some imitation demon is. And so that's... So apparently they were doing that. But Satan, why would Satan cast out Satan? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And, and that's kind of the Jesus point here. Your sons cast him out by calling on the true God because he actually has power. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so notice he says, but if it is by the spirit of God, I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. I, I want you to also notice he's, the whole book is doing that. He's showing over and over again where his authority comes from. Um, and so he's building on that same argument here. My, well, my kingdom, if I can cast out a demon, then you can see that I have authority. It's a simple argument, but, um, and then of course, you got to bind up the strong man before you uh, enter the house to plunder his goods. So again, he's using that same argument. 
Okay. Um, this is review, but what is God's kingdom? We would simply say it's his rule, not a place, but the kingdom of God is where Jesus rules. So he rules in heaven, but he also rules here on earth wherever his word is going at, if, if that makes sense. Um, so when we pray, thy kingdom come or, or your kingdom come, we're praying that his kingdom would come among us in time, that is his rule, and we pray that it would come in eternity, so that rule in heaven. So it's not like you can't put a border on it. It, it can rule all around the world, wherever his word is going on. So any questions on that? I, I know we've gone through that. So the parables are all kingdom parables. Kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that grows. Well, it's not talking about borders growing. It's talking about the rule of God growing and then growing inside of us individually as well. And then it grows as more and more people believe. So it's it, the kingdom of God is also usually connected with people and and the word of god you, you think about all the kingdom parables they're all about kingdom of god like as a man who casts seed on the ground well what is the the seed it's the word and so he's sharing the word and that's how he rules through that word okay um so i kind of split this up that this kingdom of god Remember, he's got the strong man. It says, then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Um, these particular verses, wasn't it Abraham Lincoln that somewhat quoted this as well? He, he said that a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. It's a misquote, but he is right. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so, and that makes sense. And even though Lincoln misquoted it, he is, he got the, the concept right. Um, our country can't stand if the North and the South are divided. You've you got to be working together. And it's the same way in Satan's kingdom. Satan's kingdom wouldn't stand if it was fighting against each other. Uh, although nowadays you watch some movies, and uh, I was just watching a program the other day where you had a detective that was working undercover, and he deliberately uh, hurt uh, somebody in the that was good. To show his uh, the evil people that he was working with that he was legit, but he also at the same time uh, made a secret call to uh, let them know to get out of there before anyone gets even worse hurt, and he prevented a murder from happening. So in a way, that detective uh, was not working against the good while trying to infiltrate the evil. So even in a case like that, he didn't deliberately, he deliberately avoided a murder from happening. It's a weird show. I don't know if I should even admit I'm watching it. Uh, uh, it's, it's a, I've been on this, on the Roku, there is a, it's called The Border. And I don't know if I like it. But it's it's got some interesting plots that I've kind of enjoyed. But right now, unbelievable! These shows they get so uh, they have to have at least one sex scene per episode, at least, and that that turns me off to these shows. It's, come on, you. Oh yeah, and you have to have that too, at least one, and. The plots are pretty good, but the eh, some of the other stuff, not so much. Yeah. Okay. 
Let's have somebody else read. I'm wait. Uh, Tom, you want to read this first one, verse 31? Yes. Therefore, I will tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Okay. So notice why he says this. And I think this is important before we go on. Because he's healed this man that has a demon in him <clears throat> that is let's see he's mute and can't see he's that's an interesting combination usually they're deaf and dumb but this guy's mute and blind and so jesus has been going into he heals by the spirit of god and they're still speaking against him so blasphemy is the opposite of praise, if that makes sense. So if you're praising somebody, you're speaking well of them and telling their goodness. But if you're blaspheming, you're speaking against them. And, and it's real simple definition. That's, that's what it is. So here you would be speaking against the holy spirit now i don't know if the pharisees know what they're doing quite yet or these that are there but they are and jesus is pointing out by by condemning this miracle and saying it's from satan they are speaking not against him but they're speaking against the holy spirit doing the miracle through jesus kind of makes sense um so he says here blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven okay what does that mean i i don't know what what you've been taught in the past but there to me this is pretty simple because of the greek the greek word for blasphemy it it just means speak against but it's in the present tense. And when it when a word is in the present tense, that means it is a uh, continual activity or uh, Greek. It, in English, we talk about past tense, present tense, and future tense. Um, in Greek, they do it different. They talk about uh, activity that is stationary and then activity that is ongoing. So if if something is a one-time action, it's usually past, okay? So like if I told you stop shoveling snow, that means you gotta stop right now. But if I say stop, I mean permanently stop, that, that has a different meaning. That means I'm never gonna do it again. So. Probably, Dwayne, you've had to tell people that. You're never going to do it again. <laughs> um, this isn't temporary. Um, so, But it's about what's happening to the action. So if, if I said, uh, never speak against the Holy Spirit, but here it says... Uh, well, let me go back to the translation. Every sin of blasphemy will be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And here it's in the present tense, which means it's ongoing blasphemy. So if you do it one time, that's bad. But he's talking about persistent speaking against it. Um and that's when it becomes unforgivable. Now, I don't recommend one time either. But when you're doing it persistently, that's, that's when it's bad. And a good example of persistent uh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is just plain unbelief. Because where does faith come from? From the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works faith in us, um, and he works through the Word of God. So if you constantly speak against the Bible and 
and against belief, it can lead to sin against the Holy Spirit. Now, if you stop doing that, then there's forgiveness. That, that's why I say as long as somebody comes to repentance, even blasphemy against the Holy Spirit can be forgiven. But if it's persistent, then it isn't. Um, okay, let's look at some. Uh, yeah. Um, I believe it's be purely because the Holy Spirit is the one who brings faith. And, and the Holy Spirit's the one who acts through us. Uh, we are, everything we do is fruits of the Holy Spirit. And so if you push that away, then it's, then it's unforgivable. Jesus is the, the Savior. And, and yeah, he does work in our lives. After all, he died on the cross, rose again. So that activity saves us. Um, but it's not an ongoing activity. He did it once and for all, whereas the Holy Spirit's a perpetually working in life. And so that's why uh, you have to perpetually blaspheme me against him. So I would say a person could repent up until the day they die, but after that, they've committed the sin against the Holy Spirit if they're living in unbelief. Uh, but it's purely against the Holy Spirit. Now, the Father, that, well, that one, I haven't really thought about, though. The Father, why is that not? Well, I guess if you're unbelieving the Father, you're technically blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, too. But there's really not too much to speak against the Father. He created the world, and yeah, I don't know. I, I got to think about that one a little bit more. Yeah. You're blaspheming. Yeah. In one of the other Gospels, didn't Jesus say you can face the same thing against him? Yes. In, but not in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Correct. God. Yeah, he doesn't mention the Father, but he does mention himself that you, you can blaspheme against him and be forgiven. Now, I do want to make a caveat to this. How many times can you speak against the Holy Spirit before it becomes uh, the unforgivable sin? I do not know. Don't test it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and the re I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, Saul in the Old Testament, he's a, you know, he started out as a good king. And I can't put a passage up there. I was trying to think of a one passage that summarized him. But he kind of goes throughout the book of uh, 1st, 2nd Samuel. So I'd have to, it, it's kind of an, a developing blasphemy. Because he starts out, remember, son, Saul of Ki or son of Kish. And he's a really good guy. He... Uh, starts out he's very humble uh he doesn't want to go out in front of everybody and then as you probably remember samuel uh, brings him in he begins to prophesy he, saul actually is a believer and he does a lot of good things but then it seems that power corrupts his life and and he doesn't go to God for help. Um, he makes decisions on his own. He doesn't always inquire first. And this is what gets him in trouble. Um, years ago, uh, when I was in seminary, I had a, a pastor down at Zion Lutheran Church. Uh, uh, his name was Pastor Radke. And he did a Bible study on repentance. And he spent like a month on Saul and how his repentance went from repentance to false repentance throughout his life. If we had time, we could rehash all that. But it's it, it takes a while to go through Saul's life. It's many, many chapters. And he, by the end, 
he'll say, I'm sorry, but he doesn't mean it. He he says the he's kind of like a kid. I, I remember when I my kids were young, maybe you can relate to this. They would say to me, Dad, I'm sorry. Now let's have ice cream. <laughs> so so the they 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 got this idea that the word sorry was a get out of jail free card. And then they could get whatever they want. And I said, you're not sorry. <laughs> I think you're going to get a punishment instead until you are sorry. Uh, but but that's Saul's problem. He, his faith, he, he believed in God. But God became just a means to an end to him, and he be, he kind of put himself over it. And in a lot of ways, he, at some point in his life, he commits the sin of against the Holy Spirit. It's so persistent. And then at the end, you remember God won't even listen to him anymore. He uh, won't answer prayers, purely. In the, his last episode, he goes to the witch of Endor. You, you know he's in trouble at this point and asks him to conjure up the spirit of Samuel. And now there, there's a whole bunch of problems in that passage. Who's he really talking to? Probably to a demon, if you ask me, not to Samuel. But for whatever reason, Samuel speaks to him, and uh, whether God allows that or what, but normally that wouldn't be the case. But he's committed to sin against the Holy Spirit. He's in hell. At the even while alive, normally you wouldn't say that. We say as long as a person's alive, there's still hope. But with Saul, apparently, yeah, yeah, he hardened his heart. And we, um, as Lutherans at least, and I think most denominations would say the same thing, that at that point, the sin against the Holy Spirit or hardening of heart has happened. Uh, yeah, there's no turning back. Another example would be probably Pharaoh. I think God was working on Pharaoh for a while uh, with Moses, but there came a point where he just hardened him. He was he was done. Okay, let's look at another one. Oh, I, I forgot I had this passage here. Leviticus 24. Somebody want to, Carol, you want to read this one? It's kind of an interesting passage. And they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Salomoth, the daughter of the bride of the tribe of Dan. Okay, so this is a one time blasphemy, although my guess is it was ongoing. <laughs> um, it was an ongoing one. And so, what do you do? Well, it says in the next passage, you can read this too. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take the blasphemer outside the camp, all those him to lay their hands on his head and the entire assembly is to stone him. Oh, so this isn't just a punishment of <laughs> um, perpetual sin against the Holy Spirit. Uh, you're at eternity in hell. No, they kill him too. Now, this passage, I didn't print the whole thing up there, but it says that they didn't know what to do with her. Apparently she's ongoing blasphemy and then so they inquire of god what should we do answer stone him now should we do this today no um, because we don't have a law like this however they called out to god specifically and what can we learn from this god doesn't take blasphemy lightly um, it's a big deal Dwayne, I think we may have answered about the Father, because <laughs> this is the name of the Lord. Uh, apparently, the Father doesn't take blasphemy light either. Uh, it's pretty strong. We learn from this what God says about blasphemy. It's just speaking against it um, is what it is. Okay, here's here's the other Saul. Um this is uh, 1 Timothy. This is the Apostle Paul. But he's speaking about when he was Saul. Want to read, Galen? 
and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Okay, yeah. So, so Paul here doesn't know what he was doing. We we know his life. He he was uh, taking Christians and bringing them and having them put in jail, and many of them were put to death. So notice what he says. He was a blasphemer. He was speaking against God, namely Jesus. Obviously worshipped what he thought was the true God, but he was actually blaspheming against it. Do you see where we get this idea of unbelief is, is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit so because of what Paul um, writes here? But he, he acts in ignorance and unbelief. And God's going to convert him, and he ends up believing. Okay, Dwayne, here's your part of the verse. Part of the verse. Okay. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. And whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Yeah, that's pretty strong. Um, I, I know I personally had a crisis in my life when I was in college. And right after I'd studied this verse in detail, in my regular, in college, we had to read through the whole Bible. And I, I hope they still do that in our Concordias, because um, it's a really good practice. Because just to read a little bit of the Bible in depth is good. But if future pastors and future church workers ought to actually read the whole thing through, um, it's my practice to now that I've been a pastor to read it every year. It, and that habit has been really good because, to be honest, that, that's why I usually know most of the Bible. If you ask me about it, I kind of know where it is because I'm always reading it. Um, but you forget. Um, but I remember the first time I'd gone through this in detail. What's the first thing that happens? An evil thought against the Holy Spirit pops in my head. And of course, I'm a brand new college student, and I'm thinking, oh, no, I blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. Because I had this, you know, you read it and you do it <laughs> in your mind. And it, it was Satan working on me or one of his evil demons. And, and so I went into my professor and said, I'm uh, I'm just not good. <laughs> he said, no, you didn't. You need to read the Greek. And, and you can see why this is why I went and um, ended up eventually getting my degree in Greek and Hebrew because I wanted to know more. Because it, it's interesting that the Greek really does help with these tough questions. Um, but it does say, though, notice you're not just forgiven in now, but for eternity. And, and again, that's pretty strong. But it's right. Isn't that what we believe? If you, And this is why we as a church take it so seriously. People that are in unbelief, they're not just going to be punished now, but for eternity. Hell, hell isn't um, temporary. Uh, so it, it's a big deal. People need rescue, need to be brought out of that and to eternity. Any, any questions on that, or does that kind of make it's sense? It seems that most unbelievers, you know, they'll talk about God or Jesus. They don't talk about the Holy Spirit. And it's, and it's not in their wheelhouse. Yeah, no, it's, I think you're right. Um you don't, in fact, we don't even talk about the Holy Spirit much outside when we're doing evangelism. It's just, that's about all they're going to hear. Um, Holy Spirit's somewhat of a foreign concept. I agree with you. Um, good or bad. Uh, I, I know the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, there's a huge amount, but we don't teach it. Uh, 
But really, when you think about it, half of the church year, the way it's designed is about the Holy Spirit. Um, the winter is about Jesus from Advent through Pentecost. And then Pentecost is purely about the activity of the Holy Spirit, the entire season. But yet we don't talk. This is the Holy Spirit season. Yeah, or the, the book of Acts. Good point. Any other thoughts on that? Okay. Well, let's, Gretchen, I'll give you the, the next verse, maybe, if I can get it to go to it. Is it cut off? Okay. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, again, what's going on here? He's building on this whole idea of blasphemy. Where does blasphemy come from? But out of the heart. So, so either a person's good or bad. Now, we know as Christians, a person can be changed. Um, the Holy Spirit can change a person like Saul. And he was a bad tree, but God turned him good. So I think Jesus is playing with these people quite a bit. They, they think he's got a demon in him, but you either have to be good or you're completely evil he you couldn't satan's not going to heal people it, it's just not what he does uh, and if they're going to speak blasphemy they're going to be evil notice he calls them vipers they're poisonous they destroy people when they speak it's like poison going into the ears and it destroys people around him and, and i think that's why uh uh, Paul talks about this, uh, that if you get a person that's that's doing evil in the church, you need to remove them. If they won't repent, if they just keep doing the evil, you have to ask them to leave. Um, I know that's <laughs> not something we like to do, but you don't want, uh, what is the saying go? One bad apple can destroy the whole bunch yeah and it's you don't start by removing them you confront them and speak the evil but if they're they just keep going they have to be removed otherwise they'll destroy things and, and that's the idea of heresy too if somebody's teaching false doctrine they have to be removed uh in fact right now uh, this is one of the struggles one of our Concordias uh, was basically removed by because of fat, some false teaching and on doctrine. They say they believe, but if they're not teaching right, it's um, actually most usually they close not because of on or false doctrine, but because of not having enough funds. <laughs> but that's a an excuse to get them closed. No money. Okay. Uh, oops. My, this is getting cut off here. Okay. I'll read this next one, Tom. Sure. By your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. Or, as say, by, or by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Father, which see a sign from you. Okay, yeah, and then I, I'll have to check and see if I got the rest. But notice the your words. Uh, words have a big deal. I think that's 
a lot of this is why we hear uh, these commercials all the time. If you hear something enough, they think you'll start voting for him. I... <laughs> um, although I watch those and I think, good grief, they think we're all idiots. <laughs> uh, I wish they would print the whole when they quote people and put these clicks on TV, I wish they'd put the whole quote so you know what they actually said. Yeah. But it's but but there is truth to that. If if you do hear something enough, people start saying it's true. And our educational system too. <laughs> if you say it enough, hopefully they'll it'll stick in their head. Um, why do we believe pi is 3.149? You've heard it so many times, it must be true. Uh, how many people go back and check to find out if you actually use that formula? It, it really is the radius of a circle, you know, 2 pi r, or, uh, or the the area inside, what, what is it, pi r squared? Yeah. It, is that really amount? Most people just trust it's going to work. But if you actually do the work, it is correct. <laughs> uh, that, that was my area of study. I thought I was going to be an engineer, so I took lots of math. And, and I hated geometry. <laughs> but I, I loved trigonometry. That was my favorite subject in high school. Now they don't even teach trigonometry. They just... Uh, mix it all together yeah but that's what's assumed Word, words are really important if you say something you tell your kids something they will probably believe it because you said it um, so words so we're justified by our words well how are we justified i believe in jesus christ as my savior we say that and that it, we're saved by this speaking um, well, isn't it true what's going on in your head? If you actually believe it, eventually you're going to say it. So. Okay. I don't know if I've got the next words up there or not. Oh, I do. Hmm. Nope. The end. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we'll probably. Sorry about that. We can just look. I'll stop right there and uh, we can look in our Bibles. That might be easier. Well, Norma, we're going to read on in the Bible, if you've got one, I don't have, uh, we got to the end of what I had prepared for today, um, but let's turn to Matthew chapter 12, what is it, 30, 38, actually I can just put it up on the screen maybe. I think we did. It it kind of fell apart there. Okay. I think for Norma's sake, I'll Okay. Here we go, Norma. I'll put it up on the screen. I've got another way to do it. Well, maybe. Okay, why is it not working? 
can you, did it disappear? <laughs> it does not want to show that thing for some reason. Well, anyway, let's we can look at it. So we left off right. Is it thirty-five? Okay. Uh, you you a good man brings things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone who will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words, you will be acquitted and by your words, you will be condemned. Yeah, we, we need to look at that. That's, yeah, it, it skipped that. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, yeah, given an account, as you know, the the uh, the book of life has our deeds in it. And this is one of our basic doctrines that we do teach, that we are judged by our works. And you've heard me say that before. We're not judged by uh, faith. We're judged by our works. And I know that sounds wrong but it is biblically correct. Now, why do we get in heaven? Because we have faith in Jesus, which imputes into us his works. So his perfect works then are judged and we have uh, life because of that. So judgment day is based on works. It's just not on ours when we're a Christian. And then our imperfect works that are done for the Lord are made perfect, so they are judged as perfect works. Uh, so so this, this is correct. We do what I like to call shorthand. We just say, well, what are you saved? You're saved. It's true. We're saved by grace through faith. You receive that gift of God and not by works, so that no one may boast. I know what Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 10 say, but judgment day itself, why are you saved? It's because you've been saved by grace through faith, but it's because the, the technical process is the works of Jesus are given to us. That That's where the works. So he had to do some works. Um, to Actually, he had to be perfect in all his works. And so same here. So every word is going to be and every empty word that's spoken is going to be judged. But don't worry, because you've been forgiven, those the empty words you've spoken, I've spoken, all believers have spoken, have been removed. So, okay. I must have done okay explaining that. <laughs> well, hopefully our words are words of faith. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And so we don't want to hide our, our faith. I, the old kid song is based direct on our Matthew. Uh, we don't want to hide it under a bushel, but to show it, to speak it. it remember, I started this study saying that uh, blasphemy is the opposite of praise. Well, what is praise? It's speaking about God out loud of the good things he's done. That's so it's, even though he doesn't talk about praise in this passage, that's not empty word, words. So praise is, whether in song or in uh, um, just everyday conversation, is appropriate. Uh, I think it keeps you from blasphemy. 
<laughs> so, yeah. Well, let's stop right there because um, I'm not prepared to go into the next section anyway. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I heard the, uh, our clocks all must be off. I'm what, watching the one back there. And... So Norma, thank you for coming today uh, via Zoom. And we'll see you, God willing, next week. And why don't we close with prayer and we'll pray for 